Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about a brand new product on the U.S. market that has never been sold in the United States until now. And the gun we want to show you today is in this box. And you can probably tell from the markings on the box, it was manufactured in Hungary by FEG. But before we get into today's video, guys, please take a moment, if you enjoy our content, to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. A surprisingly small number of you guys who watch our videos take the time just to click that subscribe button. So again, if you enjoy the content, please click that subscribe button and also comment down below. We love reading your comments, but it also helps us with the algorithms. All right, guys, with all that being said, let's get started with today's video and what's in this box. Guys, please swing by and check out Big Daddy Unlimited BDU. They help support us here at the Military Arms Channel with products and things like that so we can continue to bring you content. There's a link in the video description down below that'll take you to the Mac blog and website. Please follow that link and from there you'll find a link to Big Daddy Unlimited and try them out just for 99 cents. You can see what they're all about. In essence, they're just like a big online store that has amazing prices. So please, again, check out BDU. You guys already know what's in the box. It's an HD18 Hungarian SVD. First time the guns have ever been imported into the United States. There are 100 of these rifles. And I did take a peek inside the case. We've not completely unpacked the gun. We certainly haven't fired it yet, but this is what you're gonna find in the case. What a beautiful rifle. And we'll go over some of the features of this gun and how it differs from the NDM-86, which is basically a clone of early SVD rifles. So we have the rifle in here. We have the eye cup for the scope, an extra magazine, one in the gun, one extra cleaning kit, scope pouch cleaning rod, the owner's manual, pretty thick. Be curious to see what's in that. And then our scope pouch. Double A batteries, something else in there. We'll dig into here in a moment. And then a very snug fitting. Come on, baby. There we go. All right, the tissue paper got ripped off there. But the tissue paper, the scope. It looks really, really good. We'll get that all mounted up here in a minute. And then the gun. So again, the first time these have been imported into the United States, that being the Hungarian SVDs. We've seen Russian guns and we've seen Chinese guns. Not these. All right, guys, we're gonna get the scope mounted up on this rifle. We're gonna do some shooting with it, get it zeroed, and then we'll break out the NDM-86, do a comparison between this and the NDM-86, which is a classic SVD, and just have some fun with this brand new product on the US market, which has me pretty darn excited to be able to pull the trigger on it finally. All right, guys, let's do a little bit of shooting with the rifle. We got it zeroed, it didn't require much, mostly elevation changes. And we're gonna be using some Wolf 148 grain military ball. Now the rifles were optimized for the use with Russian 7N1 ammunition. I don't have any of that ammo. When you do find it, it's expensive, just hard to find. Now, Rob Ski has said that there is some PPU match out there that his rifle, which is an NDM-86, really likes. I haven't gotten my hands on any of it and I probably won't in the foreseeable future given the current market that we're in. So we have the camera set up on a 150 yard challenge target. I'm going to fire three rounds. The gun does lock open on the last shot fired. To charge it, you just pull the bolt to the rear when you put a fresh magazine in it. All right. I like the pistol grip. The palm swell on this grip is really, really nice. From what I can see here through the four power scope, it looks like two rounds pretty much stacked and another one just off to the side. And that's the accuracy we've been seeing out of this ammunition. Every once in a while we get a wild flyer, it's military ball, but it really does seem to do okay with the 148 grain wolf stuff. Yeah, it shoots really, really nice. The trigger's very light. It'll, um, it'll kind of creep 
and then it'll kind of slide and bang. It isn't a real solid shelf. And if you're shooting off a rest, it would be pretty easy to bump fire this gun just because the trigger's so light and the recoil impulse is such that uh, it'd be very easy to bump fire it. So you'll want to be careful when you're shooting it off a rest. But yeah, man, what a sweet shooting gun. I'm going to show you basically how to field strip the gun for field service, but you can go further than what I'm going to show you in this video. You can remove the hand guards. There's a lever up here and take off the front hand guards. From there, you can take out the gas system. It's a short stroke gas piston that you can take it out. It has a spring and the piston rod and all that stuff can all come out of the gun if you want to go that far. The finish on this thing is a black painted finish, which means it's susceptible to scratching. So I'm not going to take it apart because I don't want to put scratch marks out here. I'm trying to keep the gun as pristine as possible, but you can take the hand guards off, take the gas system out of the gun. Also, the trigger group in the SVD is removable. You can take the selector lever, move it up, take it out, and then you can drop out the trigger group of the gun. Again, I'm not going to do that in today's video. I'm just going to show you basic field stripping. So with that being said, let's go ahead and prepare the gun for field stripping. I'm going to drop the magazine out, put it on fire, make sure that the chamber is clear. Once I know that the weapon is safe, I'm going to lay it down on its side. Here's a tensioning lever on the side of the scope. I'm just going to push up on that and pull it rearward. That will release the tension and then the scope will slide right off the receiver. Next, you have a takedown lever here that's being held in place by a, a detent. On the NDM-86, on the Russian SVDs, there is a shelf that's cut into the wood and then there's a detent screw placed there. That's not present on the HD-18. So when you take the gun apart, you push down on this lever until you can pop it over that little detent which is right there on the receiver in front of my index finger. Rotate this down and around and stop right about there. Again, on the NDM-86, there'd be a little detent screw in there, much like this detent, that would stop its travel along with the wooden shelf. So right there is where you need to stop on that lever. Now you can take the top cover off. I'm going to push forward with this thumb and then I'm going to pinch and pull up with my support hand or my left hand. This is under spring tension. So you're going to push and wiggle and the top cover will come off. Inside you'll see the recoil spring and guide rod. Inside there's your trigger group, which again is removable if you want to, and then your bolt and carrier. Pull it back. There are cuts in the receiver that once you get it all the way to the rear, the bolt and carrier will pop right out of the gun. Rotate the bolt, push it back and rotate it to its takedown position, and then you can pull the bolt right out of the carrier just like an AK. Putting it back together, you just simply reverse the process. Let's do a little bit of shooting at 100 yards. All right. Another 100 yard group. Let's kind of shoot to the same point of aim. Man, it's stacking them in the same spot from that last group to this group, exact same spot. The optics on this thing are um, actually pretty clear. Typically, you'll see that yellow haze. I see it in my old NDM-86 scope, but that scope is a true uh, Russian-type scope where it has the infrared filter built into it. This one does not, so this is a current manufacturer scope, probably from NPZ, but it has really clear optics. The reticle's nice and sharp, and uh, yeah, it works really, really well. Man, what a pleasure to shoot. What a neat gun. So I know some of you are going to ask the question, why does it look the way that it looks, meaning sporterized? Well, if you take a look at the stock with the end cap that's on this, with the recoil pad, the slight Monte Carlo type cut to it, the enlarged pistol grip down here with the white inlaid plastic, the swelled front hand guard, and the lack of a muzzle device, well, the reason it looks like this can be summed up with four letters, B-A-T-F. To meet the sporting purposes clause 
and this is an ever-moving goalpost, by the way, uh, you have to make changes to the military rifle so it's more sporting to be importable. So that's why you see the stock in this configuration. Most likely the reason you see the bulge here in the front hand guard, and it's most certainly the reason why you don't see a flash suppressor on the end of the barrel. Now, if you go back to the original Russian SVDs that came into the country, only 200 of those guns made it in in their true military trim. After that, when they were shut off, then the Russian Tigers came into the country. And quite a few Russian Tigers came in, but the Russian Tigers were neutered. The Russian Tigers didn't have the same front sight as an SVD. Uh, if you wanted to replace that front sight, you'd have to buy the entire front sight block. It's something that would have to be pressed and pinned into place, which would then give you the bayonet lug and things like that. And those front sight blocks years ago were something like $400 on places like Gunbroker. The Russian Tigers did not have the SVD gas system that this rifle does have with the three position adjustable gas regulator. They were non-adjustable. The Russian Tigers did not have the same rear sight. They were incremented all the way up to 1,200 meters. I want to say they only incremented up to, I think, 300 meters on the iron sights. And then the stocks back here on the Russian Tigers, from what I recall, if I remember right, were even slightly different than the regular SVD. So it wasn't just a simple matter of buying SVD furniture and sticking it on the rear of the rifle. It would require fitting to do that because they changed something else in the rear of the rifle. This rifle is pretty much straight up SVD. I would imagine you could probably put SVD furniture on it. And for those that buy the rifles, they'll be able to pick up the muzzle device with the rifle and you can do with it as you wish. So I think that explains why the gun is in the configuration that it is. And yeah, thank you B8TF for keeping us safe. This is the Chinese NDM86 and 762x54R. You've seen it here on the channel before. We did a video a number of years ago comparing the accuracy of this to a Vepr and then to a PSL. So this gun is a classic SVD. When the Chinese copied them, they copied a very early SVD. And so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty much one for one copy. If we start out here on the end, you'll notice it has the SVD style birdcage flash suppressor. The front sight post, the front sight on the NDM86 is adjustable for elevation, kind of like a true Chinese type front sight hood where you can stick a tool down in there and screw the front sight up and down. And then for windage, it's a dovetail and you would have to tap this back and forth, left and right, to zero the front sight for windage and elevation. Then you have a bayonet lug here. If we come over to the FEG rifle, you'll notice that the flash suppressor is not on the gun. It had to be removed for import purposes. There, for every gun that came in the country, a bird cage similar to this one was also imported for the rifle. The owners of the rifles will have the option of getting their bird cage if they want it so that they can put it on themselves at a later date. Uh, this is not welded. It, it's on the thread. You can feel it moving, but what it looks like they've done is they put a roll pin through here and a solid pin that does not have a plunger, so there's no spring in there to be pushed back, and that's holding this device on the threads. So you'd have to punch that pin out, take this out, put your proper muzzle device on there, probably trim this and put a spring in there and put the roll pin back in place. I'm not sure, but it can be done. Now, you've already seen the NDM86 front sight. The front sight on the FEG rifles is quite a bit different. So we have an open protected hood that's open on the top here. We have a pin that's adjustable for elevation. And then for windage, it's kind of like an FNFAL rear sight. So you have a set screw on both sides of the front sight post. You can loosen this one, tighten this one, and it'll push your front sight that way. Do the opposite, and it'll push the front sight that way. So it looks like a folding sight. That's not what it is. It's just you use tools to screw these locking screws in place, loosen one, tighten one, and that's how you move it left and right. Pretty interesting. And then we have this collar back here behind the front sight post. I'm not sure what the story on that is, but you can clearly see it's different than on the NDM86, and there is no facilities for a bayonet lug on this rifle. Moving back, we have the traditional adjustable gas system. On the NDM86, you can take the rim of a 54R cartridge, slide it in here, and use this as leverage to set the position on the gas regulator. The exact same thing is true on the FEG rifle. You can stick a rim of a case in there and use it as leverage to twist this to one of three gas positions. It'll come in setting one, 
Then if you need more gas, you can put it to setting two. And then finally setting three. All those positions are meant for adverse settings. One is meant for normal operation. Here you have the takedown lever for removing the, uh, or pushing back the front handguard retainer. The same thing right here on the FEG. Moving back, you'll notice the wood is completely different on the Chinese rifle. It has this high sheen to it, the ventilation holes. Two big differences here on the FEG rifle. This is traditional SVD style grips. Here we have a walnut wood that you need to maintain with linseed oil. And then the ventilation holes are much bigger and more of them than on the original design that's on the NDM-86. If you read the owner's manual, this top row is presumably compatible with US M-Lock standards. So you can put a pick rail on there using M-Lock. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you look, when you come back here, the profile of the wood is very slim on the NDM-86. One of the first things I noticed when I picked this rifle up was, look how the front hand guards bulge right here, right about where the rear sight is. There's this big hump in the wood right there. Again, different from the regular SVD style hand guards. Here we have our rear sight. So you can use iron sights on this rifle as a backup. You can see them even with the scope mounted. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Coming back on the MDM, NDM-86, the selector lever and all the facilities back here look very similar to what's on the FEG rifle, but this rifle has lightning cuts in the machined receiver. The receivers on these rifles, both of them are machined, and then you have a stamped top cover. So this one has the lightning cuts on it, and then you have the cuts here for the um, that would be used for mounting a bipod clamps to the receiver there. On the FEG rifle, we have the cuts here for the bipod, no lightning cuts. And yeah, it's really kind of cool. If you take a look at the bolts, the bolts are identical. The ejection port profile is pretty much identical. Once we get back here, with the exception of the takedown lever having this detent. Remember when I was talking about that on, on the disassembly? On the NDM-86, you have a detent here. You push it past that detent, it rotates around. You have a shelf here that blocks its travel and another detent that locks it in place. This is not present on the FEG rifle. Moving back, the pistol grip on the NDM-86 is very small. My pinky pretty much hangs off the end of it. It's a very small, minimalistic wooden stock. If you take a look at the FEG, much more comfortable for my large hands. It's longer, has a palm swell right here that actually is conducive to just gently holding the gun, doing the wraparound, or you don't have to do the wraparound. Um, I recommend doing the wraparound because it minimizes the risk of bump firing accidentally because of the super light trigger on the gun. And as we come back here, there's a locking tab, just a simple throw lever that allows you to take this cheek rest off because with the cheek rest on, you cannot use the iron sights. So if you're going to use the iron sights, you have to pop this cheek rest off to use them. Otherwise, leave it on for use with the optic. Coming back here, we have the sling bar. Have an interesting end cap on here that's wood. If you look on the NDM-86, it's kind of a polymer. It flares out on the uh, FEG rifle. Again, just feels really, really good. Kind of more minimalistic back here on the wood. It's more rounded on this. This is a, just a different profile all the way around. And it comes back here. It's a little bit longer than it has a recoil pad on it. So it has a slightly longer stock on it than the NDM-86. In the NDM-86, I have this um, SVD boot on the end of it, which it didn't come with. I put that on later. Both rifles, if you take a look at them head on, the scope doesn't sit directly over the center of bore. It sets slightly left. This is definitely a right-handed shooter's gun. The FEG is no different. The PSO-1 scope on this one sets slightly off to one side. This scope does not have the IR filter in it that the original NDM-86 guns did. But yeah, so other than that, I mean, they're pretty much identical taking a look inside. You can take the trigger groups out of both of these rifles. Everything is pretty much 
a one-for-one -one copy of the SVD, and I would imagine a lot of the components within the MDM, MDM-86 would be uh, compatible with the FEG rifle. You could probably switch the trigger components and stuff back and forth. I'm not going to try that, but I mean, they look really, really similar to each other. So there you go. Some pretty interesting differences with the FEG rifle, mostly in ergonomics, which I think are definitely an improvement. I, I'm kind of indifferent about this swell here. I shoot typically off a of rest. I think putting M-lock up here is rather goofy, but it does go, give good ventilation, better ventilation than on the irregular NDM-86 handguards. And uh, yeah, and I thought that was a really interesting front sight. Similar, but unique in its own way with the FEG rifle. In front of me is a M91 from Zastava USA. They started bringing these into the country fairly recently. And this is a, a product improved PSL, if you will. It's based on the AK action with a long stroke gas piston where the SVDs have a short stroke gas piston. Uh, there's a number of differences between the SVD and the actual AK. So this is not an SVD. It's a improved version of the PSL. Higher quality, in my opinion, very nice rifle, but these things are coming into the country for right around 3,200 bucks. You may find them selling for more than that on Gunbroker. PSLs, they were on the market, then off the market, then they brought them back. Century Arms started selling them in the last year or two, and those things were going for about $2,000, but you'll see again, those prices going up and up on Gunbroker for the PSLs that have come into the country most recently. Then you get into talking about NDM-86s. I don't know if anybody has solid numbers on how many of these guns were actually imported, but there's quite a few of them. They were brought in in 7.62 by 54R, and they were also brought in in 308. Collectors have snatched them up. They occasionally will pop on places like Gunbroker on auction sites for sale. And there is one currently on Gunbroker this morning. I just wanted to check and see what the prices were on them. And the starting bid was $8,000, and it had nine days to go at auction. So these things have already jumped up to eight plus thousand dollars. I'm sure people will be willing to pay nine, maybe ten thousand dollars for them. And there's quite a few of them in the country. It's just that they're, you know, they haven't been imported for quite a few years and probably, well, I can say most definitely will never be imported again from China due to sanctions that will never be lifted. Then we get into the HD-18. This rifle was built from all the research I was able to do. This rifle was built from parts that the original FEG had produced. They had enough when the new owners of FEG, so FEG, the original one, went out of business, sold their assets to a new owner. The new owner went in and started looking at what they had in terms of tooling and existing parts, and they had enough parts from the original FEG product runs to assemble 100 rifles. So there's 100 of these in the country. Now contrast that against the actual Russian SVDs, not the Tigers, but there were actual Russian SVDs that were imported into the country. There were 200 of them in total. And the last one I saw go at auction was for over $25,000. So one of 200, $25,000. This is one of 100. And so you can only imagine what collectors are going to do with these. So the importer, Trident, brought these in. There's 100 of them. Uh, I know Copper has some of these available. They're going to be available on Gunbroker. So the market is going to decide the price on these rifles. They're going to start off, I believe, at $5,000, and then the bids will go from there. We're going to let the market decide how much these rifles are worth because people are fighting over the rifles already. And why are they fighting over the rifles? Well, you had a guy overseas posting to the AK files and other places making wild promises that he was in no position to make. He was not representing FEG when he was doing this, creating lists, say, get on, get on the list and, you know, a buyer's list. And people were jumping on this buyer's list. It was fictitious. Now, FEG under new ownership has said that they're going to continue production of these. If those guns actually go into production, we don't know that. We've not seen one of their actual production guns that they've manufactured off the tooling and stuff like that. But should these actually go into full production, the next batch that comes in, in theory, they'll, they'll import as many as they possibly can until they either quit doing it or you know, God forbid they do an import ban and shut down the importation of them. So the first 100 rifles are highly collectible. They come with certificates of authenticity, all that great stuff. And then hopefully in the future, regular production guns will start coming into the country, but I suspect they'll be probably in a slightly different configuration than the original 100. So that gives you an idea of what these rifles are worth and what they're selling for at current market prices.
I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at this brand new product on the US market. I can't explain in words how excited I am that these guns are actually coming in. Now again, this is one of 100. These are highly collectible rifles. Hopefully FEG is able to make good on their promise to produce these in larger quantities. And once those guns start coming in, hopefully the prices of the guns settle down and you can just be able to pick one up from your local gun shop. Fingers crossed, I really would like to see this as a regular production item. I love for our Americans to be able to buy as many of these things as they want because the SVD has been off the market for so long. There's been so many different rumors of people trying to manufacture them here in the United States, other countries out there you know, wanting to manufacture them for importation. It's interesting to note that the Hungarians never licensed the SVD from the Russians. The Hungarian military purchased rifles from the Russian government, but it's kind of interesting why FEG went to the, the, the you know, trouble of reverse engineering and manufacturing their old rifle. I mean, pure speculation. Was it that they were concerned during the collapse of the Soviet Union that they wouldn't be able to get SVDs anymore, so they wanted to tool up to produce them for their military because they do use them in their military? I don't know, but they were never licensed to produce this rifle. And you can tell that they did some, you know, took some liberties in terms of some of the subtle differences that they made to the gun that differed from what the Russians had done with their guns. Front sight, front block out here, no lightning cuts in the receiver, different type of furniture all around. Just a very interesting piece of history. Let's hope that they continue to come into the country. We're going to do a little bit of shooting as we go out. We're going to do some shooting at 200 yards and load up three more rounds of the 148 grain Wolf standard ball. One of these days, I'm going to try to get my hands on some good PPU ammunition to shoot some groups with this and see how it stacks up to my NDM 86. Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become part of our Patreon family. There's a link in the video description below. Give that link a click and join our family. You'll have direct access to me. I answer all private communications. You'll get early access to videos like this and all sorts of other perks. Again, we've built a great community over there with other Patreons for you guys to interact with. Also, right here on YouTube, there's a little join button. Click that join button and consider supporting us right here on YouTube. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 13 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs> Such a cool gun. Thanks for watching, guys.